the main topic of my presentation is about the isolate generation systems in the Amazon region. I will try to show you the real situation, the challenges, and one target that we are, uh, one challenge that we are looking for, that is how to transform the Amazon region in a diesel-free environment. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to share with you some numbers about Brazil. And uh, uh, we, we can start looking for the Brazilian economy. You can see in the left side of the slide our human development index that uh, classify us like a developing country. And uh, also the population projections for uh, the next 30 years. And when you can see that you are almost stabilizing the, 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 the numbers of, of people, and uh, of course we have an aging population right and uh, in the right side of the slide uh, we can see our gross uh, domestic product uh, that is uh, below the the average of the developed the developed countries who okay, classify okay make us a, a developing country right and uh, the second slide uh, is about uh, uh, the Brazilian power sector. And this slide is very, very interesting because it shows uh, the last, uh, more than uh, the last sev uh, seven decades. And you can see uh, uh, milestones, uh, the green one, uh, in 1962. That's where the year when the, my company, Electrobras, has been founded, has been created by the government. And uh, it was important because uh, this point uh, is, was a turning point uh, for the, the Brazilian uh, energy policies. Uh, until this, uh, the, the 60s, uh, Brazil uh, just have uh, uh, few electrifications and the power productions, uh, it was almost limited for the capital of states based in, in fuel fossils uh, like all the other developing countries. And uh, in the 60s, in the, uh, the middle of the five, the 50s and the 60s, in the beginning of 60s, uh, the Brazilian government realized that he must supply uh, more confidence and, uh, and uh, 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 to have a, 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 a supply of, of electricity that could be uh, provide all the, 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 the needs for the developing the country. And you can see that after that, we had a, 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 a huge growth, uh, average growth of, of the, the installed capacity. If you look from uh, 1962 and nowadays, we have a, a 6.2 uh, average. Uh, that is very huge. And uh, it, it was important that that's why that is, is the basis of the development of the, the economic development of the country since then. And uh, uh, one thing that's important to say that uh, in that moment when we make those decisions, uh, we really, Brazil didn't have any reserve of uh, significant or relevant reserves of oil, of gas, or of coal. So uh, the government decides uh, to use the only uh, natural resource that we had, that was water. And uh, uh, as far, I don't know, as, as you know, but Brazil is one of the countries who has a huge reserve of sweet water. And we have big rivers like the Amazon, like uh, others, others. And uh, the, the government made the decision, made the decision to use the resource. And it is, it was important because it, it, it made us uh, a very expert in this kind of development. And there is some uh, particularities of the Brazilian power sector that uh, basically forged the system as we are in that moment. It's important to say that uh, uh, to, to, to make uh, or to develop an uh, electric sector based in the hydropower plants, uh, it uh, obliges you to have uh, a specific uh, planning tools because uh, an hydropower plant, it takes almost 10 years since the initial project until uh, the operation. So you have to forecast uh, your demand 10 years in advance. And this made us 
very expert in, in demand planning and demand forecasting and other things. Other things that hydropower plants, it's a very intensive capital investment. So you have to have a specific financial tools uh, to, to, to face these things and allow the investor or even the government uh, to, to, to take this money and, and make all those investments. So the financial sector, uh, the, the, the planning system, all the procedures have been created uh, to allow us uh, to develop in the hydropower uh, project, uh, develop. And uh, Electrobras, it was created in that moment as a state-owned company, as we are until now. But uh, it was created as a state-owned company with shares traded in the market. And this has made us uh, very different from the other companies that exist in that, in that point. When you look for the result of those policies, we can see in this slide that nowadays, and this is our actual installed capacity uh, of 170,000 meg megawatts, uh, we have 87% uh, of this installed capacity from uh, generating from clean uh, sources. And this is amazing. And this is, is very interesting because when you look for uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the goals and the, the, the goals established for the developed countries uh, regarding the climate change and the energy transition, you look, you, you find some levels that are below those numbers that we have reached in that way. And uh, I used to say in my presentation that we didn't do that in the 50s and the 60s because we love environment. We did that because we really didn't have any other alternative than water to develop and to base our electric sector. And nowadays we have uh, still 65% uh, of uh, hydropower plants, but we have already in the thermal power a, a, a relevant uh, development of wind and solar. And we, we are uh, the country in South America who has the largest uh, uh, installing cap a solid capacity of wind and solar. And we have also biomass that uh, based basically in sugar cane when we have ethanol and things so. So it made us uh, a country who has uh, electric metrics very, very, very clean. The next four slides, I will, I will show you them uh, more quickly, the, but I, I like them very much because it's a time frame. A time frame when you can see how we start in the 60s and how we reach the situation that we, 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 we are today. Uh, in basis of each slide, uh, there is the installed capacity that we had in that moment. Uh, I, know, so it's, I don't know if it's visible because the minor one is, is, is my, my image is, is the right the number, but in the, in the 60s, we have almost just 1.8 gigawatts of installed capacities. And you can see the dots in the map where the cities where we have basically electricity. It was just the capital of states. When we went, you we went to the, to the next decade, you can see the, the system have grown and the installed have almost doubled. We have already 12 gigawatts of installed capacity. And we can see the beginning of two uh, regional systems. One regional system in the southeast part of the country and another one in the northeast part of the country. And uh, you can see the first transmission line in the big, the, the circles with numbers, represents the big hydropowers that have been built. When you went for the, the next slide, for the 80s, we have almost a triple of the last decade. And the, the regional system are more consolidated and we have more sources, more cities integrated. And this is, was a way that have accelerated also the electrification of the country. Because once the, the hydropower plants were located far from the load center, we have to build transmission lines. And the build and the transmission lines, it was natural ways for the electrification. It means that when we choose to explore the hydropower potential, actually we made two things. We build a very, very renewable uh, base for the, the power generation, 
And we created um, a movement to electrify the country that is very, very large. When we went uh, uh, to the 90s, you can see basically the two uh, systems is still uh, already consistent, but is still separate. It's still separated itself. And uh, uh, now we had, uh, we, we, we start to face some, some problems with those situations because as we have a very large country, we have several rivers where, where those hydrolat pens were built and uh, we have difference between the rain seasons and things like that. And since the 90s, we start to have problems with draw seasons and excess of fluid and excess water in the others. And sometimes we face it a, 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 a shortage of, of uh, generation in the north when they have excess of fluid in the, in the south and the area over, over uh, productions. And uh, in this moment, uh, we started to, to think and to work to interconnect those systems in just one system. And this happened in the end of the 90s. So when the, we reached the, the the this uh, the 2000 uh, we 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 face it we had the two systems interconnected and we have up since this moment we had just one electrical uh, system and uh, we call in brazil the national interconnected systems and since the way we created two countries one country that two parts of the country one part that is interconnected also in other ways it has the access for all those renewables and we still had a part of the country that is not interconnected it's isolated and we in in 2000 we we still have some important uh, very relevant capital of states in the state that are not belongs to the national interconnected system in that way i had almost uh, uh, 70 percent of jiggle when we went uh, for 2010, you can see that the interconnected system have grown a lot. And now the part of the country that is not interconnected is, is small and is more concentrated in the north, in the northwest part of the country. And this is exactly where we have the Amazon jungle. And uh, that we will see that now this is the big and the next challenge for the electric sector. The last slide of this time frame is uh, 2016. And I can say to you that it is almost uh, the same situation that we have nowadays. And now you can see that basically every state, even some states in the Amazon, are interconnected in the electric, national electric system. And we have just one state in the north part that is really actually isolated. It is still isolated nowadays. And uh, uh, if you look for the future, but at the moment, you can see that we reach it, the most difficult uh, part of the country to electrify, that is the, the Amazon jungle. And uh, here we have uh, several problems uh, to, to go forward with this uh, logic of to interconnect or to, to grow the electric grid. Uh, the result of this, uh, of this film is uh, uh, the huge uh, uh, transmission system that we have, and we can see in these slides uh, how it, it is uh, uh, created, how it's consistent, and, and we have uh, several uh, levels of voltage, and we have a very, very complex, and uh, we, have, we deal with all those loads and different sources and then we have very, very interesting problems and challenges regarding uh, to control the frequency, the voltage, and, and take with the, uh, the occurrences and so on. So it makes us very, very expert uh, to, to, to manage this large system. And uh, uh, since the 90s, we created just one national operator that's an independent agent. Uh, who has in charge of manage all this operation of this uh, this big system, and uh, and the second third uh, on the and the second part of the, the 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 presentation, I would like to present my company Electrobras, 
as I said in the beginning, we, we have been created, we have been founded in 1962 as a state-owned company. And uh, we still are that way. The only difference is uh, that from the, the beginning, the 60s and now, uh, it, it, it is that it was that in the beginning, we had the monopoly of generation and transmission in the country. So uh, since the 1962 until the middle of 90s, when all the Brazil, like other uh, South American countries, uh, decide to open the market for private investors, uh, Eletrobras has been in charge of planning, building, and operating all those things that you saw uh, since the 1962 until uh, 2000. And uh, it made us and gave us a, a, a great legacy in the knowledge about uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this process, uh, all this planning, and so on. But different from the other countries in South America uh, that uh, when decided to open the market, they also decided to privatize their companies. The Brazilian uh, uh, government made different. He, he just opened the market and kept Eletrobras uh, under, under its control and uh, just uh, uh, he, they give us out of, of the, the expansion from almost 10 years. And uh, we gave 10 years for the private sector to, to, to come and to make investments. And since 2004, almost nine or 10 years after the openness of the market, the government allowed us to come back to the investments, but in a different model. Uh, and and the, the, in the past, we control everything and we have the big hydropower companies. Actually, we create four regional countries because we, we had difference between the regions. And uh, uh, those companies own all the generation and transmissions and big transmissions Why? The only difference, it was distributions company that belongs to the states and sub transmissions that are internal in the states that belongs to the distribution company. But, the long-term, the long-distance transmission and the, the big hydropowers and others uh, uh, generation facilities belongs fully to Eletrobras. Since 2004, the model of investment and participation of Eletrobras has changed, and the government said to us, "You want to build, uh, you want own, uh, uh, control, anything more? Uh, all the new investments you make part as a minority stake." It will be the partner for the private because they need your knowledge, they need your experience, but you won't control it because we must to raise the, the private sector participation in the market. And that's why we had uh, in the, the left part of the slide, we have these boxes that are the companies who belongs to the holding Electrobras. You can see uh, four big companies that are former the regional countries uh, they, they own one each for each region of the country we, we can see one uh, uh, that is called electro nuclear because uh, the nuclear generation it was the only monopoly that remains with us we are the monopolies of of nuclear generation in the country we have itaipu that's very important inter, inter, interesting because itaipu is a binational between uh, Brazil and Paraguay, uh, he has uh, 14,000 megawatts and until Three Gorges has been built, Itaipu was the biggest hydropower plant in the world and it was since the 80s until the 2000s when the Three Gorges has been built, we, we were the biggest and we have half of it. And uh, we have this, uh, this blue box uh, we are with the 136 special purpose entities that are the partnerships that we have made with the private sector since 2004 and uh, uh, all the expansions since then uh, it made by this way. In a recent uh, reform that we had in the company, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we decided to, to, uh, to low our participation in some of those companies. That's why we have for one in sales, and we have 25 in extinction, we will incorporate 14, and we expect to, to low the one, 136 to 62 participation in this year. 
And uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, although we have the control by this, the Brazilian government, by the state, uh, we have uh, private investors. Uh, we have created as a, a, an open company and we have shares in the market uh, and we, are, we are have shares trading in the Brazilian stock market and New York stock market and also in Madrid stock market. So we can say, uh, regarding the international capital market, we are an international company and we have investors from the United States. We have an important stake from, uh, of shareholders in, in the United States. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, after uh, those uh, openness of the market, uh, uh, you can see in these slides what remains in the control of Electrobras. And uh, we have 30.1% 30, 30 of the all uh, installed capacity in the country. And we can uh, add more 5.3% on the nuclear and the Taipu, the binational. And uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, in partnership with the privates, uh, some very important investments like uh, Belo Monte, that is the largest Brazilian hydroelectric power plant, and we have 49% of it, and 51% belongs to for private uh, investors. And uh, you can see in the right side of the slide uh, our metrics of the generation capacity of electrolyzers. If, if, if I said that the Brazilian has 87%, electrolyzers has 96%, 96%. Of clean energy in this matter, it's made us uh, 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 an, uh, an, uh, a generation company very specialized in renewables, and that's it. It will be our focus uh, from from here for the future. Uh, we will keep in the core business of generations and transmission, renewable generation and transmission system. Well, uh, regarding the transmission system, we, we kept the control of 45.2% of the transmission lines. As I said to you, when the, the most part of those transmission lines has been built, we were the monopoly, so we, we kept the, the, the ownership of those assets, right? And uh, this is important. Uh, although we, we are in the recovering, uh, 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 financial crisis in the country and so that we, we, we still have uh, some uh, uh, expansion in the pipeline. Uh, we have 10 wind farms that we are uh, finishing, uh, we expect to finish this in the next year. And uh, we are also one uh, thermal unit that we are finishing expansion for a combined cycle. And uh, uh, I think that the most important investment that we have in the pipeline is the third uh, nuclear power plant, that's Angra 3. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge investment and is considered as a strategic one by the government. And it's, then that one, we, we don't have parking, so we, we made directly the investment ourselves. Well, uh, we have others uh, building projects in partnership with, uh, with the, the private sector that I think is, is important. Now we raise uh, the, the half of our, of our presentation and you can focus on the main issue of it, that's the Amazon challenge. And uh, I'd like just to remember the last slide when we shown the national interconnected system in that hole that we have uh, that uh, uh, belongs to the, the Amazonian states. And uh, this is important because as you said, as you can, uh, you can see, uh, we stopped to, 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 to grow the, the transmission system. And that's why it wasn't not because we, we didn't uh, decide to do that, but we, we, we faced it, we, we topped a, a, a very big challenge at how to uh, uh, expand the grid in the Amazon. And uh, uh, if, he, if you, uh, I, I shown this, this, this picture as 2016, and I said that nowadays we have something very close of it. And if, if you look for the next 10 years expansion, uh, you will see that the, the picture won't change very much. Uh, we just will make some connections for the only state that's isolated in the North, it's the only big connection that you do, you expand a little bit more from the West in the less states, but the whole is still continuing. And this whole uh, 
in this hole <laughs> exists a lot of people. And there exists the Amazon, a very fragile investment. We are talk we're talking about 3.3 million people. We're talking about 272 systems. And we talk about almost one gigawatt of installed capacity. And the only way they use it to do, to, to serve those people in those regions, is using fossil fuels. And uh, this is a very, very, it makes a, a very great contrast with the rest of the country. And we can uh, see the, how the, the systems are, 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 are served. And you can see that the diesel, although we have some natural gas, but it's very concentrated in some small big cities in Manaus where you can have some access to gas, uh, most of those systems are uh, supplied by diesel. And it gave us 94% of the energy comes from diesel generation. And we, we have a very high emission intensity on this. If you look for, uh, and more than that, how can you supply the diesel on those regions where you don't have roads, uh, you just have the rivers, and uh, we have a very huge uh, logistic for doing that. And uh, when we, you talk about roads in the Amazon, it's a, it's a nightmare because uh, it's a very, very aggressive environment for this kind of constructions. But you can think, well, I have the, the rivers, but the rivers are problems also because we, we have some drought seasons and in the, in the climate events uh, recently, it make uh, the flow of the water in the Amazon region to have a very great uh, volatility. So sometimes we have no access to those communities. We have to transport the diesel in small boats and it's raised the, 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 the danger and the menace to, to have an environment risk, to have a, a problem in those supplies like uh, uh, linkage of, of oil, and uh, you are menacing these very, very fragile environments. And uh, all of this uh, raised a question for us that, okay, and how costs to provide uh, this uh, 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 energy for those communities? You can imagine that is the cost of, of, of uh, generation there. Considering the, the diesel price, considering the, the difficult logistics that we have, the, the, considering all the costs that we have for operation maintenance for those uh, low systems split in the Amazon, it costs a lot. And uh, in, in those regions, the people who, who live there wasn't the richest people that we have in the government. So the government just have one tool for doing that, it's subsidy. So we have in this point, in this region, a huge subsidy for the, the Brazilian consumers in the suicide budget for this year is $1.5 billion. And who pays that? The other consumers. Actually, the subside is based, is, is charged for the other consumers that are in the interconnected system. So indirectly, the isolated system repre represents a high burden for the consumers in the interconnections. And this is, I think, is the, the more important slide of the presentation because you can, show, show, you can see two different countries in South, or two different uh, realities inside the country. You can see in the, in the, green, uh, in the green circle, uh, the interconnected system, who consumers has access to 87% of clean energy, uh, a uh, very, very clean matrix, a uh, uh, very, very clean generation system. We have just 0 0.1 uh, equivalent uh, tonnet of, of CO2 for megawatts. We have a cost of uh, 10 cents for, uh, for kilowatts. Uh, we have uh, uh, 2.3 megawatts our person year, the, the consumer. And we have a density of population of 52 inhabitants of Kala. Of a square kilometer. And uh, if you look for this stoles part that is not so small but has less persons, we can see 94% of full fossil in the basis of the electric metric. So you can see almost six times more emissions than the, in the other. You can see four times more, cheap, uh, more expensive energy. 
but and you see the thing that I think is more important a very low uh, uh, consum cons consumption per capita year. That it means that those people is not uh, economically developed and uh, social developed. Right, there is a, a huge potential to be developed, and one thing that is struggling this this, this, this development is uh, the electricity supply. And in those regions, we have one difficult more that we have a sparsity of population, very high, bigger than the others. So you have 52 percent for square kilometer, you have less than one inhabitant per square kilometer. And this is this 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 is the big challenge that we will try to address in the next slides. But if you see, wow, how much people live there? How much exist people exist in, in the, the green bubble and the, the gray one? I will show that uh, this is a history that uh, belongs a long time ago. And uh, what you show in this map is how the electrification uh, uh, have been, uh, uh, evolved, uh, how have been developed in the country. In this electrification, if you look at this map, you can see uh, the density of electrification in the country. In, this, in 2000, we have almost 71% uh, of the population has access to electricity. In 2010, one decade, we almost have 92%. And in 2015, that is very close that we have now, we have maybe a little bit more, we have 98% of the people with access with electricity. If you look for the red part of those maps, you can see that the things have uh, evaluated almost at the same way uh, the, the, the interconnected system did. So the logic that we have used to make this, it was just expanding the grid. And this was a very successful problem. It, it was known, it, it is known like the light for all, and, and what is, a, is a very recognized uh, electrification program in the world. It has been uh, uh, recognized by the United Nations, a very successful one. But the, the, the thing is, it makes a very great success where I could expand my, my electric grid. How can I do now when I went for a region where I cannot do that? And this is the, this is the challenge that we have. And this, 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 this figure shows the situation. We had the first uh, circle, uh, the light for all, the, the, the electrification program that make a strong success in the world and make Brazil a very, very important country with the high education that. But it was based in grid integration. And even though when they didn't have, uh, 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 didn't uh, achieve a way to spend the grid, they use it diesel for the remote regions. They use it diesel for, 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 for this kind of supply. And now we, we reach it, a limit for that. And we have two challenges in the front. First of all, we must to, to, to expand the electrification assets for the remote regions. And the problem that I cannot expand more uh, the diesel supply or the diesel thermal generation because it's a problem. It's a problem for the region, it's a problem for the other customers that uh, in the connected system have to pay for it. So the government decided to launch in the beginning of this year an, a second, another, a new program. And the program is called More Light to Amazon. And the idea of the More Light to Amazon is to follow the challenge of the light for all and, and interconnect the rest of of the population, you are talking about 2% two, two of the population. But you have to substitute, as far as possible, the diesel for renewable on those regions where the light for all uh, didn't, re, uh, uh, didn't uh, uh, get the, the interconnection and use it the, 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 the thermal uh, so, uh, solution. And uh, uh, if you look for us, uh, and if you ask me how you do how you, you, you manage the challenge for the, the more light for the Amazon. My personal and my team idea is we let you have to look for the future, not for the past for the And we, we got the inspiration in this, in this slide that we got from a, 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 a future, a long-term view for the World Economic Forum 
and you can see uh, uh, the big trends that you know more than I, because you are working with that in the, in the, in the university, the electrification, the decentralization, digitalization of the electric sector. So the idea is, how can I look for the future and apply and bring this future for the reality in the Amazon systems? And we can get those inspiration in another continent, very interesting, that is Africa. And uh, I, I will talk about Africa, not regarding the electrical system, because they have big challenges. I, 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 I use it to prospect uh, business in Africa. I, I was in charge of the international division of Electrobras uh, for the last decade. And I know Africa very well. And I can say that Africa has a big challenge in the energy sector. But they have a lesson to give to us, is in the telecommunication sector. Because what happened in Africa, that they realized that it was impossible to implement the fixed telephony. And they decided to go through the mobile telephony. They, they just leap uh, 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 this a, 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 a point and they went exactly utilizing the less uh, the more advanced technology for telecom for, for communication and maybe this is the approach we should use in the amazon region i don't need to interconnect them i have to forget the logic for light for all i have to adopt a very very different approach for the rest uh, communities that we have to supply and they have to substitute the diesel thermal generation. We have to bring the future now. And those are some initiatives that we are engaged, uh, aspirated by those visions. We are working and trying to get uh, partnerships with uh, uh, partners uh, who are working the edge of the technology and uh, we are looking for example and we are partnering with people who are working with photovoltaic floating photovoltaic because we have a lot of water surface in the amazon and uh, we are looking for the guys who are working with green fuel because we have uh, also uh, uh, a lot of, of carbon and things that you can combined with the, 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 the hydrogen produced by the, the, the renewable. Uh, we are looking, we are, we, are, we are talking with guys in the artificial intelligence, modular photovoltaic and storage solution and so on. So uh, what then we are reaching the, the, the end of the, the presentation, uh, our proposed solution is working uh, 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 for those isolated and remote communities of the Amazon giving a direct leap into the future in order to provide their own clean, reliable, and locally produced power. And one thing is important, I will come back just from this slide. When do we look for electrification in this slide, I'm not just talking about power generation. I am trying to electrify all the economy of those, of those remote communities because the diesel there doesn't I is used just for generate electricity. They use it also for mobility. If you, I like, if I, if I need uh, to, 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 to finish or to, or to disappear with the long supply chain of diesel, I have to, to substitute diesel in all the, the economy of the, of, the, of, of, of the region. And one other thing that is important to say, Part of those diesel that has been used and subsided for this sometimes has been stolen, de deviated, and sometimes could uh, 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 supply other uh, uh, activities that are not the more Republican ones. So I think this is a problem that we, we have to face on that. And the idea is uh, to, to work and, and provide uh, this new solution uh, Powering the houses and the economy uh, with MIGI and microgrid, depending on the site and location community. And then we have a high diversity of communities. We have communities that come from just some kilowatts until uh, one or until 10 megawatts, depending on the size of the community, the way the people are distributed in the territory. The challenge. The challenge is the conventional power generation as they have been implemented until now 
It's a, 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 it's a traditional way. We have a, a base load, we have a, a power generation, uh, you have a base load, you have to have the capacity into that. And uh, we have to deal with the intermittency of the renewable sources. And uh, we know, we are learning, that the load curve plays a very important role in the size and the availability of the system. And this uh, drives us to, the, to a big challenge, that is how can we manage the demand? How can we include the supply side uh, a new smart management? Although we are thinking about the traditional uh, smart measuring by then, uh, there is no intelligence in the demand side. And the, uh, the idea is to develop a protocol and how the demand side should be managed considering all the characteristics of the, 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 the renewable generation all the characteristics of the people, of the customers, and the city. In a way that this solution won't, uh, won't will limit the social and economic development of the region, and we can provide uh, a very uh, reliable uh, source for them. And the, the good notice is that it's very expensive. The way we are doing is very expensive. So. Uh, more, more, much of, of, of those new approach and technology could be feasible if compared with the cost that we, in the subside that we have to provide this. I think this is the end of our presentation. Uh, I, I really hope that I could uh, address the, the challenge and uh, I hope that I could uh, uh, provoke on you the curiosity and the inspiration maybe to go forward in this issue and uh, in the future make uh, work with us in, the, in this challenge. I think this is important for Brazil, but it's important for the Amazon itself. And it's important to, rem to remember that the Amazon is not Brazil. We have the same situation in other border countries like Colombia, like Venezuela, like Peru. So the solution that we are building here can be sca scalable for the other countries in, 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 in tropical forests like that. That's it for all. Thank you very much for in, your interest and for, for, attention, for your attention. Great, great. Thank you, Pedro, for a terrific talk. I, I uh, think the audience, uh, speaking for the audience, I thought that was a great example of enlightened uh, corporate leadership of just the kind we need now to make the world a more sustainable place to live. I do have a, a large list of questions, which I'll consolidate just a little bit. Uh, the first set, um, it's just probably a, a, a obvious that people in the US would ask questions like this. Uh, is, are the siting of transmission lines and nuclear power plants in Brazil uh, politically charged issues? So this probably has to do mostly with public uh, acceptance and so on. I know you've been all over the world, so how would you describe the uh, situation in Brazil regarding uh, citing such facilities vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world? No, oh, I, I would say that uh, the the model that we you have you you have adopted for uh, for be building and growing the uh, electric power sector sector is very acceptable for for the the population. They recognize that uh, we have a very reliable and a, a very a, 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 a very confident uh, power sector uh, as i said to you the ship electricity it was the basis for the economic development of the country since the last uh, decade so uh, i think that we don't have political problems to build transmission lines even though we, we have built uh, something in the amazon i i i saw i showed to you uh, the map and there is one city that's manaus that's in the middle of the jungle and you have to, to reach because it's, it's a very huge load and you have to, 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 to build a transmission line. And we adapt a, a design that uh, it could lower the harness in the forest uh, to give an idea, the transmission towers is almost on the same side of the uh, Eiffel Tower <laughs> because they are built over the top of the forest. So, uh, and... Uh, for uh, there is a lot of, of discussion about uh, uh, to build, for example, big auto power, a power plant in the Amazon. I think this is something that we did some, but uh, uh, nowadays we, we are considering 
very very high uh, and how to, to to do that and and how to limit the the, the impact in, in the environments and uh, uh, we we used when we when we went for for this uh, this very very fragile environments uh, we we used the very high technology because Brazil has one of the most uh, strict uh, environment law so we learn a lot we learn a lot during the last two or three decades and how to to build this so uh, i think we don't have this is not our specific problem i think our specific problem now is the high costs of the isolated system and how can we expand this and not do not impose a limit for the those regions uh, to develop because once we we make this we give room for other kinds of economic activities that are not the des desirable for for the region right obviously uh, yourself and your company are um, very advanced in thinking about grid topologies and automation uh, and i think at the end you partially answered two uh, pretty deep questions about grid um, stability and stability operation and um, uh, kind of using a, a smart, smarter grid. Um, so the, the two questions are, um, has uh, Brazil implemented controls um, or microgrids to avoid cascading blackouts in your main grid system uh, related to that? Has that been a problem in the past? And two, uh, this actually works in, partly in the other direction from the end of your talk. Is there any concern about having only a few points of contact between the northern and southern grids in Brazil? Well, uh, to, to build the, the, the huge interconnected system in Brazil, it was a, a learning curve. And uh, since we, we interconnect the two regional systems, uh, we we are learning a lot how to deal with stability and things like that. We, we, in actual, we have a lot of uh, of uh, automatic control uh, to deal with the stability problems. And uh, uh, I think that uh, talk about what we did in the operation of this huge system is is something that it, it's a, an issue for a, another <laughs> another presentation. That's a very large. Uh, actually, we, we don't have microgrid now in the in the strategic for stability, but we have a lot of local control. And uh, it's something that uh, is important to say that uh, when you have a, a base load in the hydropower plant, we have a, a huge huge uh, inertia in the in the in the in the in the, in the big hydro. And this is very important to keep uh, the the stability of the system. We have a recent phenomenon in Brazil. In the Northeast, I, I showed to you that we have 12% of solar and wind. Most of it is concentrated in the Northeast part of the country. And, and sometimes uh, this small region that is interconnected has more solar and uh, more wind and solar than hydro. And it brings to us some stability problem that they have never faced before. And that's very interesting. But when you talk about, well, you have 20%, uh, uh, no, and those regions have 50% of, of wind, and this is a problem, something that we are learning, okay? But uh, uh, in the level of microgrid and things like that, not yet. And I think that we are far from it because, uh, as I said, we have a huge pro uh, uh, system with a lot of, of, uh, of resource that we can use to, to keep the thing stable. Uh, terrific. Yeah, we, ha we have experienced such uh, too much, uh, particularly solar uh, situations in California, as you probably are well aware of. Uh, now we have a couple of technology question, uh, questions. Uh, what role do you think uh, advanced uh, energy storage technologies, particularly uh, kind of beyond lithium ion batteries, might have both in your main grid and in the Amazon? And a second question on the Amazon. Do you see any role for biodiesel to be a partial transition fuel there in certain areas or not? 
Yes, uh, I think the two questions are very, very interesting. I think the, the storage is, uh, is very important. I think the, the storage has a, a very inter interesting room uh, in Brazil. Uh, in, in the interconnected system, I think there some uh, customers are, uh, are using, and we have some, uh, uh, some grow of solar in, in, the, in, 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 the, in the final customers of the interconnected, but they are uh, uh, starting to, to, to think to use uh, storage and to, and to use and to incorporate this. Uh, we don't have a large storage in the system in Brazil yet, in terms of uh, utility scale, but we have a lot of, of distributors. Uh, uh, but in the Amazon, they are critical. In the Amazon, they, they have to be used. And the solution that you are studying is something that combines uh, uh, photovoltaic and storage. And I think that what we need now is a very, very fine uh, uh, demand control uh, to 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 make the the the, the management of uh, the balance uh, uh, demand and the generation balance of, of this, this microgrid. So for us, the storage it will be critical for the Amazon. And regarding biodiesel, it's a very important question. Brazil is is known, but his huge uh, 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 biodiesel uh, project. We have a lot of it, and it, it, it actually it, it has, and we have a very interesting uh, uh, legal framework that allows the biodiesel to be introduced in the normal uh, oil chain uh, of supply chain. So Brazil can do that. And uh, the problem in biodiesel is that sometimes it competes in the agricultural side with the food production. The Brazil is a very exporter of food now. So I think this uh, sometimes we have some kind of competition because the market for biodiesel sometimes is not so good like the food market and the, the agriculture guys decide and make the choice between one and two. But there is another thing that we are looking and I think it makes sense and it could be used in the Amazon is the green fuel. It's something that we can use the carbon capture combined with hydrogen that you can, you can produce with renewable sources. In the Amazon, we have a possibility to have a renewable, we can use solar, there is a, a possibility. There is no much wind in the Amazon, but there's a lot of solar. We have a lot of water and the water surface when you can use it. And you have carbon capture because some of the cities produce a large of waste and we can use the carbon of the waste. That's another environmental surface. And you can produce uh, the green fuel. And the, the Lego framework that had been uh, designed for biodiesel, it worked for green fuel also. So if I, I became a green fuel produ producer in Brazil, I could sell and I could introduce my, my product in the market almost immediately. I, I don't need a special law, a special framework because the framework of, of fuel in Brazil is very flexible and it has been there because of the biodiesel production. So, I think this legacy will be very important in the energy transition of the country. Uh, without getting uh, too political, I'll try to ask this one uh, uh, in a neutral way. Uh, has Brazil's support for renewable energy changed under the Bolsonaro uh, administration? Obviously, uh, people like us all over the world are asking these questions about our leaders. This is kind of the technical scientific part of running our economies versus the political leadership. Are you able or do you care to say anything about that question? I think it's... An well, uh, I, 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 as I showed in my presentation, the, the commitment Brazil with renewable has more than 60 years. And I think that is in the blood. And uh, I, I can't say anything different from Brazil. I have 40 years of uh, work in Eletrobras. I saw a big part of this film <laughs> and uh, I can say that, uh, dependent on who is in the power in the in the, the government, uh, Brazil has a strong and long-term commitment with renewable. This is our yeah. history. Okay. Yeah, as I mentioned at our pre-talk uh, chat, I, just a year ago I was down in Rio and I had the same impression, but I wanted to cross-check to make sure that you <laughs> agreed with that. Uh, so with that said, I'd like to thank you for an inspiring talk one last time. It, your talk actually think, uh, uh, seems like it's an excellent example 
speaking of the Global uh, Economic Forum, uh, uh, what the uh, former executive director wrote in his book, uh, The Fourth Industrial Revolution, which was very conceptual. So it's nice to see <laughs> someone like yourself bringing some of these ideas rapidly to fruition. So thanks once again for a fantastic and expiring talk. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure. And uh, thank you once more for the opportunity to share those ideas with the, the academy. And I think that the, the opportunity that I have to, to, to visit you there, thanks for the invitation from Mr. Lian, Professor Lian. And, and uh, what, what, I, what I saw that uh, more, more, very much that we are doing here uh, there uh, could uh, help us uh, in this uh, to build this vision, this vision that we have. Thank you very much. Absolutely, come visit us as soon as you are able. <laughs> I do that probably. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks again.